In Japan's upper house elections in July 2016, the Conservative Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was playing for high stakes. His aim was to win two-thirds of the majority in order to remove Article 9 from the pacifist constitution that prohibits Japan from maintaining a military force and from going to war. Abe thus played up the threats posed by the country's neighbors. As a result of these military provocations, the nationalists are demanding the right to build up a real army, both defensive as well as offensive. This push for rearmament, which brings back memories of the days of imperialist Japan, has caused other countries in Asia to react. Les îles convoitées, appelées Senkaku par les Japonais, Diaoyu par les Chinois, sont contrôlées par le Japon. Leur territoire est inhabité. C'est leur sous-sol, potentiellement riche en pétrole et gaz, qui attire les deux géants asiatiques. Il a suffi que cette Toyota, construite au Japon, se trouve sur le chemin des manifestants pour que se déchaîne haine et ressentiment. If we look at Japan's situation today on an international level, we can see that it does not have good relations with most of its neighbors. It hasn't signed a peace treaty with Russia, with whom it still has a territorial dispute in the north. With Korea, there are territorial disputes and a historical memory controversy. And I won't even mention North Korea. With China, there are disputes over territory and historical memory. And the United States sees Japan as a secondary power. All of this means that Japan is in a difficult situation. The Japanese archipelago is over 3,000 kilometers long, stretching from the Kuril in the north, just across from Russia, to Okinawa in the south, near Taiwan. It forms a string of islands that acts like a barrier, making access to the Pacific Ocean problematic for China, Korea, and other countries. The many islets in the area lead to territorial conflicts that are continually reopening the wounds of history. The growing threat to security from other parts of East Asia is becoming more and more serious. You have, on the one hand, North Korea's intensification of its nuclear arms program, as well as, on the other, the aggressiveness that China has been showing recently, in particular in the so-called Southern Seas, the East China Sea and the South China Sea. In addition, Japan is faced with another challenge, which has to do with China's rising economic and military power. Turbulent neighbors, an America that is hard to predict under Trump, a stagnant economy, the aging of Japanese society. To all of these complex issues, the nationalists offer a simple solution. Japan needs to have a powerful army once again, which means that Article 9 of the pacifist constitution has to be amended. Is the most important issue Japan faces today the restructuring of the constitution, or is it in many other areas of Japan that the government might be paying less attention to? And in some ways, that brings us back to the 1930s and the 1940s, that um, why is Japan pushing down this road? What is it about conservative politicians that they feel they need to promote this sort of new dialogue about a strong Japan? The desire to become a strong country was the starting point for the creation of modern Japan. The modernization process was set in motion with the aggressive arrival of the Western powers in the middle of the 19th century. America, Britain and France. Technical skills and knowledge had to be imported from abroad in order to help Japan's civilian and military industries catch up. The samurai, who had just lost their privileges as a warrior caste, were sent off to Europe to study law, medicine, science, and military systems. 
Their mission was to bring what they had learned in order to help their country. In a very short time, Japan became a modern nation with the slogan, a rich nation, a strong army. Japan's leaders wanted to avoid the sort of decline that was undermining the Chinese empire, which was ravaged by the Opium Wars as it was being humiliated and carved up by the West. Rather than isolationism, Japan had opted for modernization. China's losses were very disturbing to the Japanese authorities because they thought, well, if the Chinese weren't able to hold out against the power of the West, then how can we? We're just a little country compared to China. The idea was to import Western techniques without losing one's soul. The big difference between the Japanese system and other Asian systems was that the monarchies in China, Korea and elsewhere were an obstacle to modernization. Whereas in Japan, the monarchy, that is the real one, the shogunate, was abolished and a new monarchy was established. In order to create a state that would have a place in the club of Western nations, the Japanese elites took the European notion of rights as their model. In 1889, Emperor Meiji granted his subjects a constitution, imperial and democratic, that was inspired by France's Napoleonic Code. The new monarchy was associated with everything that was most traditional, and at the same time, with everything that was most modern about Japan. The emperor was promenaded around, dressed up, as it were, like a Western king in uniform. He would inaugurate industrial exhibits and things like that. So he was a figure who was part of a very old and venerable tradition, which was reassuring, as well as a figure connected with the modernization process. He was like the father of the nation. At that time, the country was undergoing a unification process, which was quite extraordinary. It was as if there was a desire to turn the Japanese nation into a single, homogenous unity. It transformed everyone, the peasants, the former samurai, the merchants, etc. They all became Japanese. Inspired by Prussia's victory over France in 1871, the constitution made the emperor commander-in-chief of the armed forces. This enabled the military acting in the name of the emperor to stealthily increase its own power until it was soon beyond the control of parliament. If we look at the period following the constitution of 1889, you get the impression that Japan was always at war. There was the war with China from 1894 to 1895, which Japan won. surprise. That was a big surprise. People were simply astounded that they had defeated the great Chinese model. That victory over China in 1895 was absolutely earth-shattering. It was seen as something very positive, very liberating. The victory over China was proof that the army had been successfully modernized. Japan now wanted to become a colonial empire in order to imitate and defy the imperialism of the West. In 1895, the Japanese colonized Taiwan and then established a protectorate in Korea in 1905. It was the first time that one Asian nation had ever ruled over other Asian nations in the area. Japan's colonial administration required the people under its rule to speak Japanese. It also promoted the plundering of resources and the conscription of forced laborers. Although these brutal policies went on for half a century, Japan refuses to acknowledge them. Today, Shinzo Abe's neo-nationalism angers the people who were the victims of these abuses of the past and who have not forgotten. In the early 20th century, the development of transportation networks was part of the colonial strategy. In order to counter Britain's domination of the seas, the Russians and the French decided to build the Trans-Siberian Railway, which would connect Western Europe to Northern Korea and allow the enormous Russian Empire to gain access to Chinese markets. This extraordinary railroad was seen as a threat to foreign concessions in China and to the Japanese protectorate in Korea. At the same time, the United States was taking its first steps towards Asia, 
with the annexation of Hawaii and the Philippines. The Americans also wanted to enter the race to colonize and conquer their own empire. They then gave Japan financial support so that it would go to war with Russia. To everyone's surprise, in 1905, Japan won. This was its first victory against the West. Japan was very proud of its triumph over the Russian Empire, and it led to an upsurge of patriotic nationalism that was coupled with contempt and arrogance towards the Western powers. The seeds of Japanese militarism were being sown. Once again, this was an amazing feat. This time it wasn't the Chinese. Instead, it was one of those great Western empires, populated by white people. This was happening in a highly racialized context. And it came up against the Japanese Navy. Because, in fact, the decisive event was the naval battle of Tsushima, which the Japanese won against the Russians. In 1905, Russia was forced to cede part of Manchuria to Japan, along with South Sakhalin and the southern Kuril Islands, which were taken back by the USSR after 1945. On December the 16th, 2016, the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and the Russian President Vladimir Putin attempted to conclude a peace treaty which had never been signed by the two countries after the end of World War II. As long as Japan remains the military ally of the United States, Russia refuses to sign a peace agreement. The territorial disputes between Russian and Japanese nationalists have been going on since the end of the war. A political solution is still a long way off. World War I ended in 1918 with Japan on the winning side, along with Britain, France and the United States. It expected its Western allies to treat it as an equal who had done its share of the fighting. Just at the start of World War I, the Japanese are given the mandate over Qingdao in China and the Marshall Islands in the Pacific, which had been German possessions. And they are seen, therefore, as uh, kind of the rightful heirs in East Asia to take on the imperializing mission that Western countries had begun. So on one hand, while the U.S. and the wider world are supportive of Japan's imperialist projects, they, are also, they also don't treat the Japanese equally. So there's this kind of shift or maybe a dual way of looking at Japan. On one hand, it is semi-accepted in the pantheon of great civilized imperialist nations. On the other hand, because it's Asian, uh, it's not quite seen as equal. And that somewhat grates on Japanese leaders moving into the late 1920s and 1930s. It was, of course, something of a humiliation. On the one hand, you say, here we are, we're all allies, on the winning side, at the same table. We're all on the same level, and we all have the same values. Because that's what it's all about. It's basically a question of values. We're not necessarily on the same level in terms of technical, scientific or political development, but we have the same values. And then on the other hand, you come to see that no, we don't belong to the same world. There is always a certain sense of superiority that one part of the world feels with regard to another part of the world. So it was extremely frustrating. After the humiliation of the Treaty of Versailles, two other dramatic events plunged the country into a period of self-doubt, creating a climate favorable to military adventurism. The 1923 earthquake was a terrible shock. 
It was as if they had said, well, we wanted to build a modern nation, we wanted to believe in progress, and then, bang, everything falls apart like a house of cards, and all of the effort that went into it seems to have been in vain. Another very important event was, of course, the Great Depression in 1929-1930. Japan was severely hit by the economic and financial crisis, which caused it to tense up because it needed resources, because it felt vulnerable, and it felt like the world economic and monetary system was completely beyond its control. In the 1920s, there was a growing number of social movements influenced by the Russian Revolution. Their democratic demands were crushed, however, under pressure from the military, which imposed its ultra-nationalist ideology through murder and propaganda. In the end, social instability grew worse because we didn't do what we should have done. It had gotten to the point where all the peasants had to eat was the bark on the trees. We had no choice. The only way out was military expansion, which would ultimately lead to complete destruction. That was the path that was taken. In 2011, Japan was hit by a new catastrophe. The earthquake, tsunami, a nuclear disaster in Fukushima deeply affected Japanese society on a political, economic, as well as a moral level. The government had shown itself to be incompetent. The Japanese people were left with a feeling of helplessness and doubt, but also of rage and revolt. The conservative government of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was elected in 2012 to respond to this traumatic situation. And the only response Abe found if he won the upper house elections was to revise the constitution. During the upper house elections, Taro Yamamoto, the famous actor turned senator who became involved in politics after Fukushima, came out in support of the musician Yohei Miyake, an independent candidate running without a party and without any money. Their aim was to protect and defend Article 9, which states that the Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat or use of force as means of settling international disputes. この国はハッキリしてるんですよ。70年間歴史を守り続けてきた憲法を元に憲法は最高法規。イデオロギーの問題じゃない。この国の最高法規。それに従って70年守ってきたものをたった1回のたまたま椅子についたすとこどっこい
On the opposite side, the candidate of the ruling party, Hiroshi Yamada, a confirmed revisionist, proposed to strengthen the nation once again and unite it around the emperor. When I was mayor, I changed the textbooks in my district. We had to stop giving a distorted, negative picture of our history to our children and to give them instead textbooks that enable them to be proud of being born Japanese. We have to give a new image to the history of Japan by re-establishing the truth. Japan has been dishonored and humiliated. The accusations against it have been unfair. In my opinion, there are a lot of things to be changed in the Constitution as it currently stands. But if I were asked to change one thing, it would definitely be the part of Article 9 that prohibits Japan from having an army. There will not, of course, be any wars of invasion. It's written in the first paragraph of Article 9, and I believe that shouldn't be changed. But there's no question that in order to defend ourselves, we at least need an army of our own. My country should protect me. That is the basis of any country's independence. Any constitution that does not support that is not the constitution of an independent country. The voting age had been lowered, and for the first time, anyone 18 or older could vote. But in spite of the issues at stake, the turnout was very low. On July the 10th, 2016, the ruling party won two-thirds of the majority. It would now be able to start the process of amending the constitution. The implementation of nationalist policies was stepped up. New laws were passed concerning the production of weapons and the mandatory teaching of patriotism in schools. They were the first attacks on the country's democratic institutions. Currently, the government is doing all it can to try to silence people, especially those who have become conscious of the absurdity of the system and who want to act. Freedom of expression is increasingly restricted while monitoring and surveillance are reinforced. In the three years I've been in Parliament, I've seen so many laws going in that direction. Laws on security, laws on state secrecy. We're in a situation in which more and more national security laws made to deceive people are being passed. If we take a look at the situation today, quite objectively, I think it resembles a pre-war period. If you compare the media from the 1930s to what I am seeing in the media these days, it becomes very evident. The situations are very similar. In this era of neoliberalism, there is an obvious and complete division of society. The government should thus make an effort to re-establish social cohesion, but it is unable to do so. And since it's unable to do so, the people who govern serve up a sort of bogus nationalism, which is used like a safety valve. But the danger is that things can get out of control at any time. That's exactly what happened in Japan before the war.
In the 1930s, the far right and the army infected Japanese society with an enthusiastic imperialism associated with the worship of the emperor. Driven by its bellicose and totalitarian ambitions, Japan sought to impose its superiority on other nations. I believe we can speak of an imperialism of the Far East, and Japanese imperialism also had an ideological basis. This ideology is called Asianism, Asiasugi in Japanese. It was based on the idea that Asia had to rise up against and fight white domination, mainly the British and the Americans, but the Russians as well, who had become communists, and that Japan had to lead the way in this great Asian uprising and liberate the Asian peoples from the colonial tutelage of the whites. The problem was that the other Asians didn't understand. So Japan had to explain to them, with the help of weapons if necessary, that it was in their interest to rally around the Japanese flag, so to speak, in order to free Asia from the Western world. From occupied Korea, the Imperial Army invaded Manchuria in 1931. The civilian Chinese government had no choice but to accept the fait accompli. The Japanese installed Puyi, the last emperor of China, at the head of a puppet state called Manchukuo. Manchukuo was part of the strategy. In other words, the Japanese leaders believed that their main enemy was not only communist Russia, was not only the imperialist United States, but also a unified China. The Japanese had no intention of supporting the revolution in China. They weren't interested in Chinese politics. Their aim was to restore an emperor to the throne in Manchuria, which would be to their advantage. All they wanted was a country that would be favorable to them. Yes, it had to do with cultural revenge, and yes, it had to do with finding mineral and natural resources to enrich the Japanese economy. But it also had to do with breaking up the Chinese Republic, its political system, which Japan's military and political elites saw as a threat. One must keep in mind all three of these elements when trying to understand Japan's outrageous campaign into China. A lot of historians label this period from 1931 to 1945 as the 15 year war. Even though it's not a declared war in 1931 and not even in 1937, it's a series of continual skirmishes between the Japanese military uh, and the, the Chinese KMT forces or CCP guerrilla forces or whomever, local partisans. And it kind of continues what one would call a cycle of violence. The military conquests, which were beyond any kind of political control, were combined with large-scale civilian massacres. Japanese nationalists continue to deny the magnitude and brutality of the atrocities committed by the Imperial Army in Nanking. Today, like Senator Hiroshi Yamada, they are rewriting the history books. From 1937, the supposed date of the events in Nanking, until 1946, None of the world's newspapers, not even the biggest newspapers or any of the major media, not even the Chinese government, ever mentioned the Nanking Massacre. Not even once. For a year, from October 1937 to October 1938, the Chinese government held 300 press conferences. But it never said a single word about the Nanking Massacre. If there had been a massacre, shouldn't the Chinese government have told the international community that the Japanese army had committed a serious offense? Today, the Nanking massacre is still a divisive issue that prevents any prospect of reconciliation between China and Japan. of Nazism in Europe in the 1930s, the quick 
the blitzkrieg of the Nazis into Poland in 1939 through France in the summer of 1940. And in the summer of 1940, all of a sudden, what had been a very stable system of European colonies in East and Southeast Asia now changes overnight. Japan decided to ally itself with Nazi Germany. Indoctrinated by the anti-American propaganda that they were fed, the Japanese people adhered to the ideology of the Imperial Army. They were now ready, with a sort of blind euphoria, to die for their country, die for the Emperor. The clash with the United States finally came in December 1941. The military leaders knew very well that we shouldn't go to war with the United States because we would be sure to lose. But we had no choice. We couldn't back down. And we also had to go for domestic reasons. Once it gets hold of Indochina, it then sees a moment where, if it's successful, it can create a moment against the U.S., uh, a, a, a semi-lethal blow against U.S. forces in Hawaii, against the Navy, to which the Japanese believe that America will back down and allow Japan to continue running its empire as it needs with oil, rubber, uh, materials from Southeast Asia and from Manchuria. It is a colossal miscalculation. After 50 years of war, the area of Japanese economic and military dominance had grown to cover a large chunk of East Asia. From Manchuria to Indonesia, from China to the middle of the Pacific Ocean, Japan had conquered a vast empire. Japan never went to war for the survival of the regime, but in 1941 it took a gamble that was extremely risky, and yet it went ahead and took it anyway. Then, from 1942 or 43 on, there was a sort of, I think, suicidal attitude. In other words, it was no longer about winning the war, but about dying well and impressing the enemy, which is a rather odd way to wage a war. After 1943, the Japanese knew they wouldn't win. Nevertheless, they continued. The idea that Japan didn't lose the war or its discomfort with the way in which it lost the war has always been an issue. I mean, if you, if you, particularly if we think about the way in which the war ended, the emperor himself in his broadcast doesn't use the word surrender. In fact, surrender, it's shu sen or shu en, right? The war just ends, but it's not, there's, no, there's no hai sen, there's no defeat. That's, so the vocabulary is extremely important in the way in which the war ends for the Japanese. And uh, the Americans are worried about what will happen when they occupy Japan. They really don't know what to expect. Uh, and they think that using the emperor will be one of their greatest assets 
to keep command and control not only of the population, but also of the military. At the Tokyo Tribunal, the Japanese people found out to their stupefaction about the war crimes committed in their name by the army of their emperor, Hirohito. The emperor, however, did not appear in the trials, which were set up by the American occupiers. No mention was made of his role in the war or his responsibility for the country's downfall. He was neither called up as a witness nor prosecuted as a war criminal. The emperor was removed from history. Japan is clearly having trouble dealing with issues such as the outcome of World War II, its responsibility for the crimes committed at that time, or for the violence that was the result of its colonial policies. And in the same way, it still has a hard time positioning itself with regard to America and with regard to Europe, not to mention, of course, China. In 1947, a new democratic constitution, drawn up by the Americans based on their own geostrategic interests, was enacted. The cornerstone of this pacifist constitution, the only one of its kind in the world, is Article 9, which stipulates that land, sea and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. The emperor was stripped of his powers, the United States deployed its troops throughout the islands and ordered the Japanese army to be dismantled. Japan was placed under an American military umbrella, which meant that the country was not free to conduct its own foreign policy. Part of the, the initial aspects of the occupation is to create a situation where Japan cannot remilitarize again. So it's not just about short-term demilitarization, it's about a permanent state of demilitarization, in a sense, a, a military neutering uh, of Japan. And that is really Article 9 uh, in the Constitution. In imperialist Japan, the emperor was at the top of the pyramid. It was his duty to protect his subjects whom he loved as if they were his children. How benevolent of him. If you believed in this tale, it was only fitting that you would die for the emperor when the time came. That is how Japan was. But the tale changed completely after the war. The radical new version was that above the emperor, who was at the top, there was now Washington. That was when neo-imperialism took over. So after the war, for the Japanese people, America became the emperor. Symbolically speaking, for the Japanese, America has two faces, military bases and Disneyland. And from the very beginning, we decided to pretend that the military occupation did not exist. Instead, we preferred to embrace a system in which we only accepted and consumed the Disneyland side of the United States. This is the basis of post-war Japan, but there is one place that is an exception, Okinawa. The Okinawa Islands lie at an equal distance from China, from Korea and from Taiwan. Okinawa is very close to the Senkaku Islands, which are a source of friction that inflames Japanese and Chinese nationalists alike. The US military considers Okinawa to be a strategic point in the area. In April 1945, the American forces land in Okinawa and bombarded an already war-weary population. 
the Imperial Army forced them to fight to the very end, while compelling civilians, including women and children, to commit suicide. When the battle was over, 200,000 people had died. I lived in the northern part of the island, and when I heard that the enemy was approaching, I fled north, back, far back into the mountains. There, I saw many people who had died. I saw them with my own eyes. They hadn't been killed. They'd committed suicide. But they could have survived, just like me. I think it was because of their education at school. They were students, and they did as they were told. I came from a poor family and never went to school. I'm a country girl. I was determined to survive on my own. I wanted to live. Those who are in power say that it's not good to wage war, yet they do it anyway. Why? Do they do it to make money? I want to know the truth, because I never went to school. I don't understand all of this. Today, the names of those who died during the terrible Battle of Okinawa are inscribed side by side in the stone slabs of the Peace Memorial, regardless of whether they were civilian or military, Japanese or American, British, Korean or Taiwanese. In 1951, the Japanese-American Security Treaty was signed. Having regained its independence, Japan went on to serve as an aircraft carrier for the United States in Asia. The American bombers headed for Korea and Vietnam took off from bases in Okinawa. Japan profited economically from the two wars without participating in any of the fighting. Nearly three quarters of the 48,000 American soldiers on duty in Japan are stationed in Okinawa, on bases that take up over 20% of the island's land area, giving its residents the feeling that they are captives living under American occupation. The Japanese understand very well what Article 9 gave them. Article 9 gave them the ability to focus on the economy to the exclusion of defense. And it also allowed them to not get sucked into America's uh, and, and other military action in East Asia, the Civil War in China, the Korean War, Vietnam. And of course, because they were supplying armaments and materiel for the war for America, you know, certainly with the Korean War, that's the first boom to the Japanese economy, and it, it takes off from there. In 1954, in response to the communist threat in Asia, the Americans obliged the Japanese, in spite of their pacifist constitution, to create a defensive army called the Self-Defense Forces. And now, whenever China increases its military budget, Japan does the same. Many people call that, uh, there are some political scientists that call Japan a client state or a vassal of America because it still allows a foreign military on, uh, in its uh, land, on its land, as is the case with, in Korea as well. But with the rise of China, with China's uh, more aggressive or outspoken ventures into the South China Sea, trying to push its land mass and push its own power projection. Now the situation in Okinawa is delicate. Without realizing it, we've created a system around us that has gradually shut us in. So of course it's all very nice to talk about the restitution of Okinawa. But in fact, Article 9 of the Constitution is still not applied here. 
And in addition, we are made to bear the consequences of the secret agreements, and all the secret agreements involve Okinawa. We're prisoners of those agreements. Is it right that the only people suffering from the Japanese-American alliance and the security treaty are the Okinawans? Is it right that we should be the only ones to be sacrificed for the security treaty? I really think that all of the Japanese people need to think about this treaty between Japan and the United States. We should either abolish it or break off relations with the US. I'd prefer to break off relations. I think we need to terminate the security treaty with the United States. Japan must be reborn as an independent nation, otherwise nothing will change. The inhabitants of Okinawa, who were opposed to the presence of American bases on their soil, represent the last stand for a pacifist Japan. In a context of rising tension with China, however, Shinzo Abe's government is more intent than ever on pursuing its military cooperation with the United States. The ruling coalition won more than two-thirds of the seats in the elections. Three days later, on July 13th, the public television station NHK made a special announcement on the 7 p.m. news. It's the biggest news program of the day, the one that has the highest number of viewers. A few minutes before the broadcast began, NHK aired a breaking news bulletin. They reported that Emperor Akihito had expressed his wish to abdicate the throne.私日本国憲法下で象徴と位置づけられた天皇の望ましいあり方を日々模索しつつ過ごしてきました。In this declaration, the emperor says he wishes to abdicate during his lifetime because he wants to conscientiously fulfill the symbolic role attributed to him and which is defined in the constitution, meaning the emperor wants to protect the current constitution. We find ourselves in the rather surprising situation of having the emperor emerge in a certain way as the guardian of the democratic freedoms and the pacifist constitution, against his own government, which is seeking to challenge that constitution. In political terms, this is quite an unusual situation. It's the emperor who is currently the primary, if not the only serious opposition figure, because in the Japanese system as it is right now, there's no longer any real organized political opposition. I was struck by the fact that the emperor used the word symbol so many times. By repeating the word symbol, I think it's his way of warning us that our national unity is in grave danger. It's clear that the emperor is criticizing the fact that there are forces right now, Shinzo Abe and his administration, that are preparing to change the constitution. On one hand, they want a constitutional revision, which means that if Japan has its own standing military, the American bases would pull out. But that also is a little worrisome for Korea and the Chinese, who, if the Americans pull out, then what system is in place to keep the Japanese and the Chinese from going at each other yet again? It's not Mr. Abe's military budget that worries me. I'm more afraid of what's going on in his head. The weapons don't scare me. It's the reason why he wants those weapons.
What will they be used for and against whom? What I'm concerned about is whether he's going to explain the rules of the game to the Japanese people and whether his governance will be transparent. What it shows is a certain refusal to take history into account, the history of the region and of the frictions that may exist there, the geostrategic frictions between China and Japan or Korea and Japan. It seems to me that the Japanese government is actually adding fuel to the fire by refusing to take into account the past, the historical memory. In other words, the history of the relationships between Japan and its neighbors, which is obviously highly charged. As it is being herded into the tunnel of nationalism, Japan, in its refusal to recognize history, is a source of concern and irritation for its neighbors. The only path towards reconciliation is for Japan to build a collective memory together with the other countries in Asia and make peace with the past. Will Japan, under America's umbrella, ever manage to find the political consciousness of an independent nation? ただ平和になってほしいなという願いだけでは平和な世の中にはなりません。やはり自分にできることを行動に移してみんなで平和な世の中を作っていきましょう。